Thank you. Well, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to our ongoing Covey Lecture Series for 2017. I'm Debbie Ingalls. I'm the director of Covey, and it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker today, one of our uh, Covey researchers, Dr. Gary Pickering. For a little bit of background on uh, Gary, Gary is a professor in the Department of Biological Sciences here at Brock and also in the Psychology uh, Department here at Brock. He's also a founding member of another very successful research uh, institute here at Brock, uh, the Brock's Environmental Sustainability uh, Research Center. Uh, Gary is a prolific scientist in terms of uh, getting his work out there. He's published over 180 peer-reviewed papers, conference proceedings, and books. I think that may actually be a record, Gary. Um, he's affiliated with a number of national and international research uh, institutes that uh, really help uh, further promote uh, the research that he is doing. Among those are the Network for Sensory Research at the University of Toronto, as well as uh, the Charles Sturt University and University of the Sunshine Coast, which are both located in Australia. His main research interests are prim primarily concerned with flavor science, enology, and the psychophysics of taste, with recent projects focused on adaptation to climate change and the role of taste in wine consumer uh, behavior. His presentation today will bring together some of the findings from years of collaborative uh, research centered around green flavors in, uh, in wine, uh, which were also conducted in partnership with colleagues of ours that were part of uh, an Ontario research group called, called the Ontario Grapevine and Wine Research uh, Network. Uh, so with that, please join me in welcoming uh, Gary today. Well, thank you very much, uh, Debbie, for the introduction and for the opportunity to, uh, to speak today. And thank you for turning up. It's wonderful to see so many uh, familiar, friendly, smiling, not yet to sleep faces. So thank you. <laughs> what I want to do is talk about green stuff in juice and wine. In particular, I want to talk about methoxypyrazines, which are the main uh, compound that contribute uh, unripe flavours, vegetal flavours and green flavours uh, in wine. I want to uh, start by giving an overview of what these methoxypyrazine uh, fellas are and their relevance to wine quality, then talk a little bit, not much, on the implications in terms of preventing methoxypyrazines in the vineyard and then focus on remediation. What happens if you have juice and wine that is affected by methoxypyrazines? What options as a winemaker uh, have you got to, uh, to remediate that? There'll be lots of graphs, so a warning, lots and lots of graphs. I'd make the case that you should be demanding of anyone that's standing up here that they should be showing you lots of graphs, or at least showing you the data. I don't care if they're wine marketers, policy makers, enologists, viticulturalists, or any other ilk of researcher, ultimately show us the data should be your rallying call. Particularly in a post-truth world, I think we need to be very um, cognizant of, of showing evidence and making evidence-based decisions in all aspects of our lives, including in energy. <coughs> so, lots of graphs. Start with some acknowledgements and, and apologies to, uh, I'm sure, the several people that I may have missed off this list, but these are a list of, of colleagues that have um, done all the hard knacker, the hard work and behind the data that I will present today. Um, Andrea Bonazzato and Debbie Ingalls in particular are prime collaborators on this methoxyprosine project. But I think it's also, uh, if not more so, critical to acknowledge the students um, and the technical staff who really do all the hard work uh, that make us as academics look good. So thank you to many of those folks in the room uh, just, and just in general to this list of collaborators. None of this work is possible without funding, and our industry has been um, a strong sponsor of our, of our work through the Ontario Grape and Wine Research Inc. and other bodies, and uh, the Ontario Research Fund in particular has also um, made much of this work possible. Now I think I've lost my little red laser already. Technically, ah, there's an on-off button. <laughs> 
Can we see that? We can. Excellent. Okay, so not many um, chemicals to, to, to talk about or to show you. These are the only, I think, slides that, that show uh, any chemical structures. What are methoxypyrazines? Well, they're a very important and very powerful class of odorants. Things that affect the smell and the flavour of both juice and wine. They can be derived from fruit, from microbes and from insects. I'm going to treat these four, these are the four main methoxypyrazines that we're aware of in wine as one synonymous group. That they are different, they have small differences in chemistries and behaviour, but in general they do behave in the same way in wine and in our sensory systems, and in general their origin and their synthesis in grapes is similar. So I'll be talking interchangeably about, about these different forms of methoxypyrazines. The common thing that they have, as well as their behaviour, is that they taste and smell green, green and vegetal. So typical descriptors might be cut asparagus, earthy, peanut shell, bell pepper, grassy. Some of these uh, pyrazines differ slightly in the predominance of, of the character, but in general, earthy, green, vegetal. They are methoxypyrazines. So in terms of absolute concentrations in both or in wine, this thing called uh, dimethylmethoxypyrazine and IBMP are the most, most prevalent. There's lots of them. You only really see this compound being talked about because until recently we didn't have the analytical abilities uh, to measure uh, well the other pyrazines. But in fact, it looks like there are several pyrazines that are, are important, uh, and this being one of them. So, Pyrazines are not all bad. In the case of a few select grape varieties, they can be considered part of the expe expected aroma and flavour profile, or, or typicity. A classic example of that is Sauvignon Blanc, in which a touch of bell pepper or green character is seen as one of the complexing elements. It's not the dominant flavours. We now understand that thiols are the most important in terms of the tropical profile but the fluxypyrazines do contribute a greenness that's considered expected. Uh, Carmelia, and to a lesser extent, these Bordeaux red varieties, a low level of methoxypyrazines, a touch of green or vegetal character uh, might be seen as part of the typicity. In every other variety, they're considered, uh, if, if they're present at above perception level, as being a taint or, or a fault or highly undesirable. Now, another important thing about all these pyrazines is that they have a very, very low sensory threshold. The amount needed in any matrix, a grape, juice or wine, is very, very low before it will elicit a green or unripe flavour. So this is some values from the literature. Just to give you an idea, in the case of uh, IPMP, which I'll be talking about a lot, the human sensory threshold for smell it's 320 picograms per litre. It's tiny. An analogy that helps me get my head around that very low number is the weight of DNA within one cell within a hummingbird. It's roughly the same order, the same order of magnitude. It is so tiny. And therein lies a, a, a key problem in terms of uh, detecting and analysing pyrazines and in terms of remediating pyrazines, you're having to get very, very low in terms of chemistries um, to even detect these things, let alone remove them. And as a sensory scientist, I'll be remiss not to talk about um, uh, individual differences and matrix effects, at least for a couple of minutes, so bear with me. Um, some work that we did a few years ago looking at the, um, the human threshold for IPMP, one of the important pyrazines. This is for smell, and this is two different uh, wines, a red blend and a Gewurztraminer. And here we have uh, the number of, of participants and their individual thresholds. That is how much IPM, IPMP is required before they can detect it. And I won't tell you the, the method behind this, but it's quite rigorous. So a couple of things pop out. First of all, our threshold in Gewurztraminer is about 50% higher than what it is in red wine. So the matrix, red versus white, aromatic versus neutral, does matter in terms of how and where we can detect these compounds. 
Uh, we can also see individual variation. If we take the Gewurz Tremina as, as an example, this individual here only needs about 260 picograms per litre to detect this compound. This person here needs a bucket load before they can detect it. That's roughly a 400-fold difference in our sensitivity. And that, should, have, that should, should get you thinking in terms of implications for things like um, blending decisions in the wineries or QC decisions in terms of making a call as to whether or not a wine uh, does have excessive pyrazines or not. Individual variation is huge for pyrazines in general. Apologies, this slide's not as clear as what it could be, but it's just illustrating that the mode of evaluation, smell versus taste, also matters. The data here is for uh, dimethylmethoxypyrazine, a different beast, but we see the same patterns with other pyrazines. So to, to quickly um, deconstruct this, essentially a, a low threshold um, means that we need less of the compound before we can detect it. So we're about twice as sensitive to this pyrazine when we smell a glass of wine than when we taste a glass of wine, which may help to explain some of the differences between what we experience when we nose the wine and when we taste the wine in terms of quality and the impact or masking of greens. So always be aware of these averages that we, we see in the literature for sensory or for chemistry work. They're just that averages and often um, belie the influence of these important things like matrix effects, mode of evaluation, and individual differences. So, where do pyrazines come from? Three sources, grape, adulteration, and bugs. I want to talk briefly about those three uh, different sources. So, great sources of methoxypyrazines. Again, those four uh, pyrazines that we started with look to be present in grapes as an intrinsic part uh, of, of um, or intrinsic metabolite of grapes. We find them particularly in Sauvignon Blanc, and again, these, these uh, Bordeaux reds uh, and Pinot Carmenet. The concentration within the grape varies, most is in the stem, most of the rest is in the skin and seeds, and there's a tiny amount in the pulp. And we think these factors are important in terms of uh, mediating the final concentration that we might find uh, in our finished wines. So the traditional wisdom is that the cooler the climate, the higher the methoxypyrazine load in the grapes. But to be honest, the more recent literature, including some work from, um, uh, from Covey, uh, casts some doubt on that. It looks to be a very coarse generalisation that may not hold up. But that's, the, that's the received wisdom uh, anyway. We know that they do, the pyrazines do decrease during the ripening. They're at their maximum around two to three weeks pre veraison and then, and then uh, decrease right through to harvest. There's increasing evidence, albeit largely anecdotal, that climate variability may increase the load of pyrazines, both in, in cool climates, but also in hot climates like California. I'll refer you to this, uh, this review from uh, our colleagues in BC, and uh, I think George in Athens uh, was a co-author of this paper, a very good review uh, in terms of the grape-derived methoxypyrazines. This is some work that we completed recently um, as part of uh, Andrea Bottazato's PhD here at Covey was um, looking at a global survey of wines supplied by the LCBO and breaking them down into the individual methoxypyrazines. The reds, so that, again, apologies for the figure, colour coded would have helped. We can see there's big spikes here for Cabernet, Merlot, and Pinot Noir. These correspond to dimethylmethoxypyrazine. In a global survey, that looks to be the most prevalent pyrazine in wine. We can see IBMP uh, looks to be highest in, uh, in Cabernet Sauvignon and Cabernet Franc. <coughs> and we get varying levels in the other grape varieties. Interesting, Sauvignon Blanc and Chardonnay uh, have appreciable levels uh, of um, at least three of these four methoxypyrazines. They're not just confined to red wines. Right, second source, adulteration. That's the illegal fortification of uh, wines with any compound, in this case, with foxy 
What a naughty, naughty lot the South Africans are. Several years ago, they were caught with their hands in the chemical till, and there were prosecutions. If you think back to the 80s, arguably the archetypal Soviet bloc style that many of us tried to emulate was Marlborough, New Zealand, Sauvignon Blanc. It was chock full of green, earthy, bell pepper, capsaicin notes. The more the merrier. We know those compounds are methoxypyrazines, primarily IB and P. Well, some naughty people uh, decided that they would use um, methoxypyrazine uh, uh, from a lab and literally adulterate unfinished wine with that and bottle it. I'm sure it's not happening now, uh, but we need to be aware that is a, that is a documented source of pyrazines uh, in wine. Ladybugs, lady beetles, and these two species in particular we know contribute in some years and in some regions methoxypyrazines to both juice and wine. The one that's best described is called the multi-coloured Asian lady beetle, Maorb, Harmonia, there's various names that we use for this beast. Typical biocontrol story, it was introduced several times in this, in this case in the States, in the South, uh, for control over aphids and slowly it's migrated its way north, um, outcompeting local lady beetle species and, in fact, and, and um, becoming a, a, an issue in unexpected ways. So in uh, several regions and Appalachians within uh, the states and also in several regions here in Canada, we know that it migrates into vineyard, vineyards in, in, fall, in autumn. Typically when it's prime uh, crop, uh, locally soybeans have been harvested, uh, it's looking potentially for a carbohydrate source or at least some shelter over winter, so it appears in a vineyard, unfortunately around the time of harvest. That's fine, they're cute little fellas, don't do any harm, do they? They do, if they're incorporated during the harvest operation in with the grapes. They become incorporated and then are part of the, the, the flow, the stream after that, the crush, stem, fermentation, then they contribute methoxypyrazines. The same methoxypyrazines we find intrinsically in grapes is partly why it's taken a long time to unravel the story of what's causing these green flavours from ladybugs. And the descriptors, not surprisingly, are consistent with ladybugs, and I won't bore you with the years of work that's gone on to show that, yep, pyrazines are the, the compound responsible, um, and the beetles um, uh, elute this compound from essentially their blood, their hemolymph, in response to stress. And it's stressful seeing a great big harvester coming your way during vintage, isn't it? <laughs> now, it's definitely not a problem limited to Canada. In fact, we know it's widespread within France, within some regions in Germany, definitely within the US, and very likely in many other wine regions. Uh, it's just not as well publicised. So this is very much a global problem. And thanks to uh, uh, Kevin and Ryan, there's some shots. They're the extreme examples of infestation of ladybugs throughout the architecture of a vine. In reality, they're more of a problem when they're hidden deep within the grape bunch. Because as, as few, as little as one bug per vine can be sufficient to taint the resulting juice and wine. And that's much less obvious, this fella here, buried deep within a bunch than what these examples are here. So, let's first of all talk about prevention. And, um, and in the vineyard, can we prevent methoxypyrazines derived from grapes? Short answer is no, because they are intrinsic in many grape varieties. And I suspect we'll be um, showing that they're intrinsic in a lot more varieties than what we previously thought. Now that we know about this thing called DMMP, now that we have better analytical techniques. So we can't get rid of them in the vineyard. We can minimise their concentrations before the grapes arrive at the winery, uh, through light exposure. Okay, that's been shown in several studies, and I'll show you some evidence for that shortly. So one, one, the typical example of that would be through leaf removal uh, techniques. And simply ripeness. Anything that can be done in terms of cultural practice in the vineyard to maximise ripeness will result in a decreased methoxypyrazine load. 
So some early work by a French group, this is simply showing um, during the growing season changes in IPMP concentration. As I said, two to three weeks before the raison is typically maximum concentration in the berry and it decreases right through till, uh, till harvest. These are three different regions within Bordeaux, so we can see that region has an effect in terms of the rate of um, drop in pyrazine and in terms of the final concentration. We can also see, comparing in the next year, Cabernet Sauvignon with Merlot, that variety matters in terms of both in terms of particular starting concentration. And we can see that vintage matters. This uh, vineyard here is the same as this vineyard here. And we can see massive differences from one year to the next in terms of the methoxypyrazine load. So region matters and, and variety matters and vintage matters in terms of the pyrazine story. This is some work um, done on South African Sauvignon Blanc. Uh, we've got uh, IBMP here. And again, we've, got a, we've got measures of time through to harvest. And these individuals looked at simply um, removing both the, the, um, the leaf and the lateral shoots around the fruiting zone um, pre veraison uh, on one side of the vine, the, the vine that was exposed to morning sun. That's this treatment here. And you can see what a massive difference there is compared to the, the more fully shaded uh, treatment right through until vintage. So, sh so light exposure does work. In this case, it would have made no difference, more or less. At, at, at harvest, there was no difference between the treatments. But you can easily imagine uh, a poor finish to the season in terms of low heat units or rain, and having to harvest somewhere around here, you get a big difference in the green character between shaded fruit and exposed fruit. But again, pre veraison is the key time for exposing the fruit. It makes little or no difference post veraison uh, also in the vineyard, the traditional way of managing uh, the ladybug source of the foxy pyrazines is through sprays. And these are the two sprays that are used predominantly in Ontario, um, with, with uh, cypermethrin, I believe, the, the dominant spray that's used. And they are effective. Some issues, potential issues, I think, with any spray is, is the, um, the potential for um, uh, uh, high residual levels, depending upon the spray regime that's been used. But also efficacy. Both of these have pre harvest intervals, and ladybugs do reinfest the vineyard multiple times, which might include um, the pre harvest interval. So that's a real concern. Well, it's a concern in terms of limiting how effective sprays can be in some situations, which is why this study, um, uh, developed by um, uh, Debbie, uh, Wendy McFadden Smith, and other colleagues, I think is, is quite exciting. They looked at um, potassium made by sulphite, so a common anti-preservative, uh, antimicrobial used in the winery the world over. So we're familiar with what it does at the winery level. Spraying this on grapes um, at a, a, a rate of zero, five, or 10 grams per litre, uh, they monitored what it had, what its effect in terms of the density of ladybugs on the vines after spraying KMS. The neat thing is, you get about a 50% reduction in the total number of beetles uh, with this treatment of simply spraying a cheap, widely available, um, wine approved compound. And so in some follow up work, I believe uh, they showed there was no deleterious delir effect at all in terms of grape and wine, uh, juice and wine performance and quality. So I think this is an exciting um, possibility. Well, it's being used now. We're almost in the winery, just where I get excited. I mean, grapes are just bundles of joy that arrive at your doorstep. I mean, what happens prior to the winery? Who, who cares? But we better finish off for the viticulturalists around. Uh, grapes arrive. We hear anecdotally in several US regions that in the case of ladybugs, soaking or dumping your bins of grape and other material into a water tank is very effective. And bugs float up and can be sieved off and separated, and then you can drain the tank and process your grapes as normal. Looks to be effective. There are dilution and quality issues, and depending upon your interpretation of some of our legislation, some legal issues with this in Canada, 
nonetheless, this looks to be effective um, uh, and, and anecdotally. And of course, shaker tables, um, where the, the fruit and the, uh, the beetles uh, are on a conveyor belt with a mesh, and, and the, the, the mesh shakes, and the beetles fall through those holes and can be extracted and removed from, uh, from the bunches. Of course, limitations there on how much you can process uh, and hand harvest fruit only. So it's limited, but it is effective. Wine, winery. What happens if you've done what you can to prevent either grape derived methoxypyrazines being at high concentrations or if ladybugs become a problem in the vineyard? You've done what you can, but you still have a product, be it grape juice or wine, that arrives in the winery with high methoxypyrazines. Let's see what you can do throughout the entire winemaking process to potentially remediate this problem. So one of the first questions the winemaker has to ask is, is do I crush, do I de-stem, do I do both, do I clarify? Well, take home message, very, very important to de-stem, must de-stem. Why? You look at this work from, again, from the Bordeaux group. At harvest, this is a breakdown of where the methoxypyrazines are located within the berry. We can see that the majority of pyrazines are in the stem. What remains primarily is in the skin, which also speaks to how we might deal with the skins. Critical that we de-stem. No matter how fancy you want to get with your Pinot Noir in terms of anthocyanin and, and pigment retention or other reasons for using stems, if you suspect there are issues in terms of ripeness or high pyrazine levels, you have to de stem. Minimise skin contact. We see the remaining pyrazines are primarily localised in the skin. And, the, and experimental research shows that the, the, the lower the skin contact, the lower the methoxypyrazine load. In fact, two to three times uh, lower if you do uh, reduce skin contact time. Interestingly, it doesn't mean that you can say, okay, that's nice, but I'll, I'll just leave the skins there for one or two, one or two days to get a bit of uh, um, aromatic pickup or, or for other reasons. Don't, because Ethanol, alcohol, is not critical to the extraction of the pyrazines. Most of it happens in the first 24 hours. So we've got to minimise where possible skin contact. Make a very big difference. Okay, juice clarification. You know, how clear do we want our juice? How do we find, how do we clarify our juice? Does that impact upon pyrazine? The answer is yes. In the case of IPMP, unclarified juice, in this case, had 40 nanograms per litre of pyrazine. Any clarification treatment gave us a significant reduction. With a halving of that total uh, content, if you allow it to settle naturally over two days. That's a big, particularly if you use accumulative techniques to reduce concentration, that's a big drop. So do clarify. Uh, some exciting work from, um, from Debbie, Debbie's lab uh, has been looking at using a highly specific molecule for binding with the pyrazines that can then be removed from juice <coughs> in the wine. One of the real issues with treating and trying to remediate juice in wine is the compounds that we have available in our arsenal at the moment are not specific. Yep, as you'll see, some will pull out some pyrazines as well as some of the goodies, as well as some of the desirable aromatic and flavour compounds. A BC called an odorant binding protein, and one in particular, uh, has been optimised in, in Debbie's lab. And here we have some, some graphs showing uh, IBMP and IPMP response to this odorant binding protein. If we just focus on the juice treatments, this fella here and this fella here, this Chardonnay juice that was treated with the odorant binding protein, then a PES filter. That complex of the protein plus the, again, the odor binding protein plus the methoxypyrazine, but it binds and is pulled out by bentonite, a ubiquitous finding agent, leaving barely detectable, if not, if not um, lower, levels of the pyrazines in the, in the juice. High specificity, very promising, and some of the follow-up work that the labs do at the moment is looking at, at how to optimise that system in terms of binding the, the proteins to various matrices, various solid matrices, to make the application easier and more efficient, and also to investigating and optimising how the system might work in a wine matrix.
Ethanol is not good always for proteins in terms of their tertiary structure, in terms of their binding. So it may not work as well in a, in a wine matrix, that's to be determined. This is very, um, I think, exciting in terms of potential for uh, high pyrazine juice, no matter where those pyrazines have come from. One of the next things a, a winemaker can do if they've got the equipment, and of course um, in a lot of Germany um, they have, is thermovinification, which is simply heating the, the, the must um, over a short period of time at a very high temperature. So often used with Pinot in Germany in particular to extract uh, colour primarily. And this work in fact was done with some colleagues at um, uh, Julius Kahn Institute uh, in, uh, in the Rhine. And we can see, um, we can see this is not clearly because of the data, but if we look at um, three different treatments, three different levels of pyrazines, and the four pyrazines themselves, this here is the net reduction in pyrazine load due to thermovinification. If you average all this stuff out, it comes out at 20 something percent reduction in IPMP from thermovinification. And that agrees roughly with some earlier work done on IBMP. So it looks like it looks like all the pyrazines important to eliciting green flavours can be reduced using this technique. Of course, there's reasons why you may not want to use the vinification, including not having access to the system, uh, but it does work. And the sensory data um, reinforces this effect. Next thing you do as a winemaker is either you allow the fermentation to go au naturel, or more typically, you add yeast. So, we thought, I said we, that means something went wrong. We thought <laughs> that if you look at a pyrazine, this is IPMP, but it's a, a heterocyclic thing that contains nitrogen. And what do yeast love to do, guys? Munch up nitrogen. So we thought, that's cool, maybe we could screen several commercial wine yeast and find one that will preferentially chomp up that nitrogen and yeast can do the work for us get rid of those nasty pyrazines. So we, start, we, we screened a few commercial strains and um, decided to go with four to test under lab conditions. This is the uh, IPMP concentration of a juice prior to fermentation. We thought we would give EC triple one eight a go because everyone uses it. I love triple one eight. But you can see that after fermenting with triple one eight, there was no difference in the IPMP concentration. 118, who cares about that? Let's look at the next one. Well, D80 gave us exactly the same result. Who cares about D80? D21, exactly the same result. But BM41, everyone talks about that. 41? 45, BM45. Well, no. In fact, <laughs> consistently, we did this, this work several times, we didn't believe the result, but consistently BM45 didn't decrease in the fluxypyrazine load, it increased it. And we hypothesised a, a, a pathway whereby that might occur in this yeast strain. That's a bummer for us. But interestingly, if you do the sensory profile and the sensory work on wines made from those different yeast strains under a high uh, methoxypyrazine juice load or IPMP load, you get some interesting results. You might predict that because these fellas will give you the same level of IPMP, you, you could use either of those yeast strain if you have a, a high pyrazine juice. It'll give you the same sensory effect. In actual fact, effect, in actual fact no. This is a sensory map. The distance from here to the outside tier is just a measure of intensity for the various taste and aroma attributes. So we saw that BM45 was something to be avoided because it tended to give higher IPMP levels and there's some um, sensory evidence of that as well. But really interesting is the D D21. You see that the D21 for the ladybug uh, or the pyrazine notes is lower than any other yeast strain. And why might that be the case? Because the IPMP concentration is the same. Look here, you see that it produces a lot more um, uh, fruity and jammy flavours, as, as yeast do, they differ in the composition of the, their own profile. 
So that, that strain, by producing um, higher concentrations of desirable uh, odours or volatiles, is masking the effect of the greenness from the pyrazine. So it's definitely worth considering this yeast strain if you know you've got a high pyrazine juice, and it's definitely worth avoiding BM45. Okay, so the wine's fermented. What happens next, depending upon the wine style, um, MLF uh, is the next, next step. And unfortunately, uh, work shows that MLF does not modify the pyrazine concentration significantly. So the lactic acid bacteria aren't going to help you out. Lots of, I shouldn't say lots, but, but sufficient anecdotal evidence to suggest that microoxygenation might be effective at producing green aromas. However, I, was, I remain surprised, but when you do a scouring of the scientific literature, there is actually zero evidence to back up that belief. Under tightly controlled microox conditions, when a sensory panel is trained and the profiling is done, you don't see any evidence of a reduction in the green aromas. You might see, however, um, we do see a reduction in some of the astringency and bitterness profiles that you might get from underripe tannins, and that might be associated with general greenness. But in terms of green aroma or green flavour, um, there's no good scientific evidence that mocks will help. We can find wine. We did that several, um, several years ago. We did some bench testing, uh, looking at potentially uh, beneficial fining agents. We came up with um, uh, light, so UV light in theory, or degrade methoxypyrazine, so we exposed high pyrazine wine to UV light. We used activated charcoal, again used co uh, commonly for all sorts of uh, problems in, in wine. We used oak chips and we used deodorized oak chips to be able to differentiate whether or not um, any reduction in, in greenness was due to a masking effect from the oak chips or maybe direct binding of pyrazines to lignin or other structures within the, uh, the oak chips. This is the starting concentration of IPMP and you can see nothing makes a difference except for activated charcoal. We are seeing a significant drop in IPMP with that and similar results no matter what wine style we use. However, what's the however? However, activated charcoal is effective at removing pyrazines and everything else in wine. It's very non-selective. Therefore, the next result shouldn't be surprising. We put those same treated wines through a trained uh, descriptive analysis panel. And I'm just showing you data here for the uh, aroma and flavor characteristics that we associate with pyrazines. So these are the things from pyrazines. Nothing above the line is evidence of a net increase in these characteristics after fining. Nothing below the line and indicates that the green characters have been decreased as a result of fining. So where's our famous activated charcoal? There he is. And for most attributes, he's above the line. He's actually added greenness. How might that be, you say? Activated charcoal is pulling out everything. So it's pulling out stuff that is also potentially masking the greenness from the pyrazine. The only thing that was consistently um, successful, only significant for one attribute, but the trend is there, uh, is oak chips. So, so normal odorised oak chips are effective, quite effective, at reducing green characters. And it's through a masking effect alone. Which, you know, if you're making wine that traditionally um, stylistically, you use uh, oak for uh, has got some advantages. Um, some more recent work um, uh, pioneered by Andrea Bottazzati was looking at some other uh, potential additives at the wine stage that might remove pyrazines. And so we settled on two, a silicone and a polylactic acid um, uh, substrate, and we looked at how uh, exposing uh, finished wine to these two different uh, treatments might affect the pyrazine load. And we can see that no matter which pyrazine, we're getting quite a significant drop using both silicone and uh, polylactic acid, with the PLA in particular showing <coughs> quite a marked decrease. <coughs> Excuse me. That's quite exciting. Both of these things are, are, are food safe, are used throughout the food industry. 
depending upon your interpretation of, uh, of our wine act, may or may not be able to be used um, with, with wine and juice. The silicone work um, mirrors some results that uh, Gavin Sachs's group in Cornell found um, uh, a few years earlier. So that's exciting. What's also exciting is that when we take the polylactic acid and um, apply it to the, the high pyrazine wine and analyse the desirable odorants and flavour, flavourings, flavourings, flavourants, and here we have a representation of the typical chemical groups that give us desirable notes, esters, high alcohols and so on. The general pattern is these things don't change much. That is, the polylactic acid, perhaps surprisingly, doesn't adversely affect most of the desirable odorants. Maybe the one exception, and even then it was not significant, is isoamyl acetate is lower in treatments of polylactic acid. Well, that's some um, artificial banana flavour. I don't know if you want that in high concentrations anyway. So this is quite an exciting result. PLA looks to be effective at reducing pyrazine loads significantly and for three of the four pyrazines measured and doesn't bugger up your wine too much. Caution, we have been unable to date to replicate these findings, this finding in particular, in, in a commercial scale. So we have scaled this up once at a commercial um, facility uh, at Niagara College, and we haven't been able to demonstrate this decrease that we see at the microvinification scale. We changed our source of PLA for the commercial trial, maybe that was th the issue. Um, we can't think of logical reasons why it wouldn't scale up, but to date we haven't been able to reproduce that, that finding. Okay, one of the last things that you do as a winemaker is make a decision on how you're going to um, package your wine, uh, how you're going to close your wine, and how you're going to age your wine. So can we influence perusing load through those, um, uh, those options? So in terms of ageing, some earlier work suggests that the perusings in this case, I believe it was just IBMP, uh, are fairly stable, up to one year, no decrease. Because wouldn't it be nice if after a year or 18 months the pyrazines drop, off, drop out and you're laughing, you can release your wine. Doesn't look to be the case. Some work from um, Amy Blake, as part of her graduate studies here, showed a, a modest increase after a year and a half for, the, for, for two of the important pyrazines across several wine styles. Uh, and we postulate that might be due to, to binding with some, some phenolic co uh, compounds. What Amy also looked at was comparing different packaging options, specifically aseptic cartons, so Tetra Pak would be one of the most common brands, and bottles, and bottles of varying colour. So different uh, colours, brown, green, clear bottles allow different amounts of UV radiation in particular to come through, and we know that UV radiation, at least in grapes, can degrade pyrazine. So a cunning plan, maybe glass colour, could help us with um, decreasing pyrazine load. What we did find, perhaps surprisingly, was that Tetra Pak was, was very effective at decreasing uh, methoxypyrazine load. But... Tetra Pak uh, also resulted in higher concentrations of oxidative compounds. It also results in free SO2 dropping very quickly. So it's not a treatment that I would, uh, I would recommend. Um, we also played with different closures, screw caps, synthetic cork, normal cork, different brands. We found that in general, corks sealed, uh, bottles sealed with synthetic corks did show significant decreases in the pyrazine levels. So that's something you can do. To, to touch up, if you will, a high loaded uh, wine at, at the bottling stage. We also found that uh, exposure to light, particularly in clear bottles, did reduce uh, all pyrazines. What we didn't do though was measure other um, uh, odorants in those wines, and so we might predict that we get a generalised UV oxidation of desirable compounds as well. We don't know, but it will be a fair prediction. Conclusions. Drum roll, please. So, pyrazines are very potent, odour active compounds that at low levels can be desirable in a small number of wine styles, but typically are seen as being undesirable. And they're sourced primarily from, from grapes and uh, from insects, ladybugs. 
So the several viticultural interventions that can make a difference in terms of prevention are all focused on light exposure and the different ways of maximising light exposure in the fruiting zone, but pre on looks to be critical to make a difference in the vineyard. Once the fruit arrives in the winery, definitely de-stem and wherever possible minimise the skin contact. Choose clarification, no matter how you do it, looks to be advantageous. If you have access to thermo vinification and it makes sense in terms of the wine style, then that also helps. Again, we're looking at a 20 to 35% reduction. Again, these things are significant as, as cumulative treatments. Yeast strain matters, not always in the way that you predict, but look at your yeast and make informed decisions. Unfortunately, the pyrazines are resilient to most traditional refining agents. Oak does help. These two uh, polymers look, look promising. I think particularly promising is the odor binding protein uh, that's been worked on, um, at least uh, for juice. It looks to be uh, um, uh, able to be commercialized and have very high efficacy. And, I hate to say this, okay, not yet, closure and packaging affect the foxy pyrazines. Small differences again, but synthetic corks look to make a, look to be uh, desirable. What happens in the vineyard looks to be most important. Prevention at every stage, be it from rock grapes that aren't achieving optimal ripeness and therefore have higher pyrazines, or be it from ladybugs. Prevention in the vineyard looks to be key. Thank you. Exposure to sunlight that was making such a difference? Yeah, that's a great question. That was um, some, some Bordeaux work uh, done over a decade ago. I can't recall the details um, other than that from year to year the uh, viticultural practices were kept the same. So I think those, those between year comparisons are valid, which is sort of mirror what we expect anecdotally too. Uh, in terms of within, within varieties and within regions, I don't know if they had standardised. Uh, or not their practices. So, good question. Steve? I just wonder, going back to your last point there, and in, in, your, in your readings, have you seen any work done or indication that there's any clonal variation in the vineyard that could lead uh, to improved uh, results for the fact that you wine? So here's the problem. <laughs> I toyed as to whether not to put any viticulture stuff in at all. <laughs> Um, I don't know, is a short answer. Uh, I, I don't think that work's been done, just from my perusal of the, the viticulture literature, which is not extensive. I don't think so. Maybe with, with Pinot Noir, which of course clonal stuff is a, is a key research area with, with Pinot. Um, but if so, I haven't seen it. It's, it's an interesting question. I mean, I, one could expect there will be variation. And given that um, these compounds are synthesized in, uh, in the grape, actually they're synthesized in the various parts of, of the grape, of the vine architecture, including the leaves, but they are synthesized in the, in the, the grape itself rather than translocation from other areas. And, and knowing the effect that genotype can have on that, it would not surprise me if there are differences. I think, I think a, an equally interesting question is how large are those differences compared to cultural treatments, you know, light exposure, um, vintage variation and so on. I would suspect that there's they, they're small differences, but I don't know that. If you're interested in answering that, Ted, we're just about to put a clone rootstock trial uh, planting in so that uh, for clones, for rootstocks, for um, four different varieties, so 16 combinations, oh, wow. Chardonnay, Riesling, uh, uh, Bruno, and um, Pinot Noir. Well, for those two reds, that'd be fascinating to track the, the perusing levels, yeah. Thanks for the extra work, Steve. No <laughs> uh, I had a question about the last experiment with the polylactic and the sultan. 
when you try to scale it up in the winery, did they try different ways of mixing? Because I know with certain things, it really depends on how slowly you add it, what mixing is done, and maybe that's affecting your scale up. That's a great question and a great speculation, and I suspect the answer is yes. Um, just due to resource limitations, we had one shot at, at scaling this up in one vintage and took our best guess in terms of um, several parameters, but particularly how best to introduce these beads, because they're, they're small beads, and we may have got that wrong. Um, I, it doesn't make sense to me that it won't scale up in terms of the chemistries, so it may literally be a matter of optimising how we introduce uh, the product. That's, yeah. yeah. I just have uh, one last question, Gary. Uh, are you aware, is anybody following up on vineyard deterrent uh, systems uh, like to prevent the ladybugs from ever wanting to come in uh, to the vineyard? I, I know we had started some work with our colleague at Guelph a few years ago, but uh, um, it, have you come across uh, you know, any more recent work that um, places around the world are starting to look at? Yeah, my, my understanding is that there is there is still work being done in, in the US looking at um, potential deterrents that can be, you know, safe stereochemical based deterrents that can be used in the vineyard. Because that would be a cool way to deal with ladybugs anyway, wouldn't it? A compound that would, have, that would either deter them uh, or that would attract them could be used as a bait to one part of the vineyard or your neighbour's vineyard and therefore <laughs> leaving, your, leaving your vineyard uh, uh, mouth free. So that work is, I believe, going on in the States. Yep. Any other questions? With that, uh, Gary, a small token of our appreciation uh, for your talk today. Thank you very much. And uh, I just want to uh, remind everybody that next Wednesday, Dr. Andy Reynolds, uh, uh, another Covey researcher and professor here at Brock, uh, will be giving a lecture. Uh, his lecture will explore opportunities for remote se sensing using unmanned aerial vehicles. Uh, otherwise known as drones, uh, to map variability in Ontario vineyards. So I hope uh, to see everybody.